Good afternoon and welcome. Welcome to today's Senate Occasional Lecture. My name's Tony Machulik and I'm the Acting Clerk Assistant of the Procedure Office here in the Department of the Senate. In welcoming you, I'd like to acknowledge the Ngunnawal and Ngambri peoples who are the traditional owners of the Canberra region, pay respect to their elders past and present and of all Australia's Indigenous peoples. The National Gallery of Australia has a portfolio of over 150,000 individual works of art, valued at around $6 billion. The National Gallery collects a diverse range of art from all over the world and showcases it both in the gallery here in Canberra and through loans and touring exhibitions, making art accessible and meaningful to diverse audiences. Here at the Senate, this year, 2020, marks 50 years of Senate committees. For 50 years, Senate committees have been shining light on diverse issues of relevance to our nation. So in this, our first lecture for the year, it's my pleasure to introduce Nick Mitsevich, who will speak about the art of democracy and the power of the National Art Collection to nurture identity. Mr Mitsevich has been the Director of the National Gallery of Australia since July 2018. He's led galleries in South Australia, Queensland and New South Wales. He's a recipient of the Museum and Gallery Services Queensland Outstanding Achievement Award in 2009 and he enjoys widespread recognition for his open inclusive approach to engaging audiences. Will you please join me in welcoming Nick to the Senate Occasional Lecture Series. Good afternoon everyone. Um, in my traditional family house, I would say Dobloden, which is hello in Macedonian. Um, on the lands of the Nambri and Ngunnawal peoples, we would say Buriguri. Um, in other customs, we would say hello, good afternoon. What I love about Australia is that we have so many different opportunities to connect with our culture. And, um, my mother is from the northern part of Greece, called Macedonia, and my father is from the southern part of Macedonia, um, and uh, that in itself is a conundrum. Um, and um, my family made their way here from the early 1950s and made their home here, and they were farmers. And uh, they taught me about respecting land and respecting the things around us and to appreciate uh, the things that grow and the things that prosper. And strangely, I use those uh, things I've learnt as um, the custodian of the National Collection. Because the National Collection is something that needs to be nurtured. It needs to be um, looked after. It needs to be reviewed. It needs to be developed. It needs to be opened up and discussed in the same way that nurturing the land does. And uh, I'm, I'm, I think that it's a, it's a great uh, privilege and responsibility to look after the National Collection. And I regularly say to people that it's certainly not an honour. It's a great responsibility. It may be an honour afterwards. And, but while you're in the chair, it means that um, the National Collection is there to enrich the lives of Australians. And uh, the Parliament made a really dynamic decision in the early 70s to do um, and set up a national collection. And for more than 100 years, the states collected art uh, from Europe, from America, and from Australia. But there was no true national collection that uh, went beyond the state borders. And this Parliament, sorry, not this parliament, but parliament, um, made that strident decision to start collecting. And uh, in 1971, hired um, a director to start assembling the National Collection. And in, uh, then in 1982, after nearly 11 years of collecting, the National Collection opened. And it was quite a bold move. The Lindsay Report, which parliament commissioned, made the point that 
we should leave the historical collections to the states because they'd spent over a hundred years collecting them. And the national collection should focus in on bringing the best of the world to Australia that focused on the 20th and the 21st century and exploring the rich history of Australian art that went beyond state borders. Looking at Australian art from a truly inclusive perspective, looking at the work of First Nations artists and the work of um, non-Indigenous artists and bringing them together to ensure that Australians had access to the best art available. And we've assembled the collection of 155 works of art. So how do you put it to work? How do you make that extraordinary collection accessible to people? And how do you have a dialogue about what art is in the 21st century and how you have a relevance to Australia today. And I suppose that's the job that the National Gallery has, to answer those questions or try to find a way to connect with those questions. And um, I think one of the important things for me is to look at how we rethink history and how we revise um, the history of art so if you went and picked up an art textbook published from anywhere between the 1950s to 2000, you would either see Indigenous art at the very beginning, focused on um, cave paintings, or at the very end, um, as an addendum to contemporary art. And for me, it's really important that we acknowledge that art uh, was made by both First Nations artists and the settler community that arrived here and that we look at how the stories of conflict and the stories of, um, com of things that we have in common uh, are explored. And I think that art uh, is continually changing because we're continually making discoveries about artists. And it doesn't matter if they made art 100 years ago or 50 years ago, we're con continually learning more. And I love that part of art because it's alive and it's changing. And it's not that we alter history. We learn more about the past with time and research. And the National Collection is part storehouse. It's part research institute and it's part civic space for ideas. And the fact that we have those three roles is really critical in continuing to explore what it is to be Australian and how artists have reflected um, national identity. And it's really interesting to think about that in a de democratic society and um, how we have this great opportunity to re always rethink history with the knowledge that we acquire through time. So today I wanted to talk about two projects that really explored how um, the inclusiveness of art can have an impact on the identity of Australia. First, I want to talk about Belonging, Stories of Australian Art, which is a, a new project that for the first time in the National Collection uh, hangs both First Nations art and non-Indigenous art together to weave the complicated story of Australian art history. And um, the National Collection previously was hung quite separate. So there was an Aboriginal section and then there was an Australian section. So these disconnections, I think, are not helpful in bringing Australia together to have a shared approach to history of creativity and a, a shared approach to, um, to identity. And um, we brought our curators together to um, start working on a project that helped us see Australian art from multiple points of view and not the view of a historical text. And so our Indigenous curators worked closely with our curators that worked with our non-Indigenous collection. And for the first time, they looked at um, history through multiple points of view. And uh, we start the display with a, a lullaby by a contemporary Australian Indigenous artist, Christian Thompson. And this lullaby is documented in the photographs behind me. He sings a lullaby and that welcomes you in to the display um, from an Indigenous perspective. Uh, performance, dance, music are such an important bedrock 
of art practice, that we thought it was an important way of introducing a narrative through, through a song, a song that um, leads you into the exhibition called Belonging. And uh, the exhibition juxtaposes works of art uh, throughout time, so it's a, it's a, a, a trans-historic display. And we look at works from uh, the 21st century and also works from the 19th century and bring them together to have a dialogue. Um, the display starts by looking at personalities and looking at artists that um, define what it is to be Australian. And so the presence of Indigenous peoples is an important part of the first stage of this exhibition. And so we've taken the, um, the work of uh, Tasmanian Aboriginal artists to welcome you to this display. And we juxtapose uh, images of the 19th century with images of today. And so these um, works by Benjamin Law that um, uh, document uh, two very important figures uh, from uh, Tasmania, Triganini and Wararidi. Uh, these two uh, heroes uh, of um, Tasmanian Aboriginal culture uh, were documented and uh, serve as a reference point. And they're juxtaposed with the work of a contemporary artist, Ricky Maynard, looking at Indigenous peoples today in Tasmania. So what the display does do is try to put the past and the present into some context and juxtaposing um, figures from different time zones is an important way of ensuring that there's continuity in the way that we see art. The display also looks at geography as an important uh, tool to think about a sense of place. Geography from um, the, the fabric of the materials, for example, in colonial furniture using Australian timbers, um, the geography of place through the work of colonial uh, European artists, and the sense of geography from the work of indigenous artists. And uh, this, um, this juxtaposition here looks at two works of, this, of a similar scene, but from, um, from different points of view. We've got an, an image of Sydney from 1857 by Conrad Martins, um, a British settler, and also Napa Napa uh, from her first visit to Sydney, looking at a similar scene. Um, they share geography here, but they come to their subject matter from different points of view, and it's about respecting and acknowledging those different points of view. Um, the display also looks at traditional bark paintings and um, these works look at um, the history of trade and relationships. Uh, the work on the, um, the right, uh, it looks at the Macassans trading with um, Indigenous peoples in the far north. Um, exchange that happened before settlement here in Australia. So looking at Australia pre-settlement. And as we continue in the display, uh, it juxtaposes geography and, and identity with various um, artists looking at those perspectives. One of the things that's been important is to use uh, works produced in particular geographical areas uh, to, to signify um, that Australia had um, an indigenous culture that dated back some six, 65,000 years. And uh, we've used um, important objects uh, from geographical centres to uh, show how um, both uh, Indigenous and non-Indigenous artists have looked at geography as an important part of defining history. And in this slide that I'm showing you, you see the works of a number of um, British artists that arrived in the colony and documented the extraordinary geographical um, uh, 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 ge the geographical um, uh, definitions of the Australian landscape from lots of different points of view and also a series of Indigenous shields of similar uh, geographical centres and that there was this cohabitation. Uh, as you can see from these three examples, um, this is a, these three come from a similar geographical zone but you see a shared love of geography and place, but 
three different approaches to documenting a sense of place. Um, and it reminds us that we see things differently. And through the eyes of the artist, the experiences that we bring to creativity uh, define who we are. Uh, the display looks at both juxtaposing two and three dimensional works of art and in this image here uh, you see the morning star poles uh, juxtaposed with uh, uh, silver and, um, and carving, uh, again that revolves around a sense of place. One of the most important elements of the 19th century was the fascination that settlers had with the, um, the wonderful um, flora and fauna that was here in Australia. And there was extraordinary work done in the scientific and exploration area. And the National Collection holds great journals of this work. Um, there was a great appetite, particularly in Europe, for these exotic plants. And the National Collection shows these um, native species that um, were fascinating to settler culture. But also um, we look at how uh, both um, early botanical studies are juxtaposed with traditional uh, indigenous bark paintings. And in this uh, slide, we have watercolours uh, from the 19th century with um, a, a series of works that look at how indigenous artists have captured um, looking at um, the indigenous species of this country. And what I find really heartening about this image particularly is that there's both, there's such a great attention to detail and um, uh, an attention to really capturing the, the essence of um, the Australian um, uh, animals and plants that made up uh, this, uh, this, this unique country. Um, just a few more images of the display to see how the relationships uh, come together. Um, I want to just uh, stop on this point. Uh, this uh, slide that I've just put up looks at um, how um, grief and mourning are an important part of shared histories amongst all Australians. And uh, we see um, uh, two works that are separated by 150 years. Uh, the work of Julie Dowling from 2005 and the work of Robert Dowling from 1856. These are both mourning pictures about loss and about uh, how we uh, as humans uh, have to bear uh, loss and mourning and how um, regardless of culture and time, loss and, loss and mourning are very important elements of our cultures and they're, they're potent and they define us at times. Uh, in the same way that um, geography is really important and uh, you see the views of Eugene von Gerard here with two colonial views and then um, two ancestral shields from the 19th century that um, are made in these geographical places. Um, seeing how these two uh, cultures have represented the sense of place through the making of these objects. One of the um, most uh, potent parts of Australian art uh, is two really extraordinary movements. And many people outside of art know these movements. They're called the Australian Impressionist Movement in the 19th century, which came out of an Impressionist um, uh, history that, that emanated out of Paris. And Australian artists travelled to Paris and were inspired by the work of the French Impressionists and only last year, the National Collection showed the work of Monet. And this is one of the most potent and defining uh, elements of Australian art history, where, where artists went outside, they looked at the environment and they painted the light that was Australian light. That chalky blue sky, those burnt yellows and oranges, of um, the landscape in the middle of summer, those hazy blues, um, artists out making these immediate sketches of the Australian 
uh, outback and also um, the harbour. And um, these images became iconic images of Australian art history. And the second really uh, most potent movement is the Western Desert um, movement that came out of Papunya from the late 70s. So if there's two movements in the history of Australian art that were breakthrough moments, that were moments of absolute resolution that influenced um, the future, it is the Australian Impressionists and the Papunya Western Desert movements. These two movements at their core had a great sense of similarity. Artists from both of these eras, with more than a hundred years separating them, responded to the landscape. They used colour and they used immediacy to define their views of country. And in these images that I have before you, you see the, um, the relationships. Um, in a very cheeky and provocative move, um, we see um, these two works, uh, 1889, Golden Summers, and Ceremonial Ground from 1981, uh, staring off each other. Um, at their heart, they're about a response to country. One comes from a European Western, Western perspective, and one comes from uh, an indigenous perspective looking at the land and country. Um, both are about trying to get a sense of authenticity about the country and the landscape and the things that make it up, make up what, what that place is all about. It's about a response to um, the emotions of that place and the feelings of that place and also trying to capture a sense of geogra geography. Um, the uh, Impressionist painting looks at topography as an important element in defining that and perspective, Western perspective, while the Indigenous work looks at the symbols of country, um, an aerial shot of country and tries to um, define it through symbols that, that may at times reference a, a map. Um, and what the National Collection does in bringing both Indigenous and non-Indigenous perspectives together is it tries to demonstrate that we have a rich history that shouldn't be defined by history textbooks and that what we're trying to do is lead a progressive cultural agenda that acknowledges that um, art making in this country has been quite diverse, but the things that separate us aren't that far apart. That we're all, we're passionate about love, loss and landscape. Uh, and um, together, we, they form a really potent mix. And Australian art is richer for bringing um, a multiple point of view, a multi-point of view together to celebrate and explore Australian art. And the world looks upon us uh, as a very curious place. And I think art can help define it. Uh, this rich history that, that reaches back at least 65,000 years and the points of contact that changed history, changed and changed our way of life as we progress are really important moments that, um, that are captured in art. And through the eyes of artists, we see, sorry, through the eyes of artists, we see the, this, this richness that at times is full of conflict and at times there are connection points. And um, I think that's an exciting part of art. And this project display at the National Collection demonstrates um, how we're trying to be inclusive about creativity in Australia and how we're trying to lead um, an agenda that, uh, that gives preferences to multiple viewpoints. 
And we're not rewriting history because history writes itself. What we're trying to do is define creativity in Australia as having so many different points of reference. And I think um, uh, as we progress, um, bringing uh, art to the public consciousness that tries to explain our similarities and differences is very potent. And um, when we live in a world full of such uncertainty, there's one thing that I'm certain about, and that's the voice that Australian artists have is an important element in really defining um, our future because we must make sense of the past to be able to take the next step into the future and to define who we are as Australians. Living in a democratic country means that um, we can explore lots of elements of who we are uh, with, with great, a great sense of freedom and that history shouldn't be locked away because it was defined at a particular point of view under a particular political, social and economic perspective. Now in the 21st century, um, uh, at my job is to make sure that history is inclusive of, of all parts of creativity and that the only thing that we use as a defining, um, that def should define it, is excellence and innovation. If an artist builds upon something from the past and does it with a great sense of clarity and a sense of innovation in their mark making, in the voice they have, uh, art should be elevated. And connoisseurship is such a, um, a fuzzy concept, but I um, always think it's, it's a science. It's about knowing the past, defining what are the, the moments of breakthrough and resolution, and elevating them. And uh, I think um, when we constantly are rethinking the ways that we can express the creativity in Australia, it's important that those things guide us and that we're also led by ensuring that Australia is not separated by categories, that Australia uh, and its culture uh, is elevated in a manner that's reflective of the way that we want to progress as a nation. Um, and that's to bridge the gaps between understanding, to bridge the gaps between confusion, and to bridge the gaps uh, between the things we know and the things we don't. Uh, so I hope that you might have a chance to see this project, uh, which will have, uh, hopefully in the future, uh, a bigger footprint in the way that we might look at our collections and the way that we, we are chief storytellers through the eyes of artists. Um, I always say that we don't publish books, we don't really do exhibitions. Um, what we do essentially is try to tell stories from multiple points of view and at times they could be in books and they could be in exhibitions. But uh, ultimately what the National Collection strives to do is to tell stories through the eyes of artists about who and what we are. A second thing that I wanted to talk about today was a project that will, um, will unfold over this year called Know My Name, which is also about reviewing how we've looked at the role of women artists in art history. And so Know My Name is a project that is, is about elevating the work of Australian women artists. And um, we'll have a major exhibition in May that looks at the contributions that women artists have made from 1900 to the present day. And you might ask yourself, well, is this just political correctness? And um, I like to say that when the playing field continues to be uneven, special showings are significant. And because of limitations in art schools and education, social um, uh, restrictions, and the changing nature of society and the role that women have to play in a democratic society, that uh, it's very important that we elevate the position of women artists. Women artists only make up 35% of the national collection, and that's uh, something that we want to focus in on. 
and um, the exhibition uh, looks at the, the extraordinary contribution that women artists have made in the development of Australian art history. And uh, this slide uh, is a, a really potent slide because it's a series of self-portraits by Australian women artists. And um, the gaze of these women artists hopefully will encourage us to learn more about them. We started this project by asking ourselves, could you name five Australian women artists? And um, many people we asked that question of couldn't. So we knew this project had a role to play. And we're going to publish uh, books. We're going to put exhibitions on in Canberra. We're going to tour exhibitions around the country. And we're also um, going to fly over uh, cities. So this is the work of the Australian artist Patricia Piccinini. Canberra audiences are very familiar with her work. This work called Sky Whale was commissioned in 2013 by Robin Archer for the Canberra Centenary and it's recently entered the National Collection. The first flying machine or aviation device that's also a sculpture to enter the National Collection. And the work is both a flying machine or an aviation um, uh, craft and a sculpture. And for the first time in my career, I've had to apply for an aviation license, something that I didn't think would have to happen. And uh, we also have commissioned Patricia Piccinini to make a brand new work uh, to, to make sure that Sky Whale isn't too alone. And she's, she's in the final stages of producing a work called Sky Popper Whale, which is the male counterpart and um, brings the family together because the new hot air balloon also includes five babies that are the progeny of these two uh, flying machines. Um, and the two balloons will fly over Canberra uh, as a very contemporary modern family. And then over a series of months over Canberra, the two works will then fly across Australia and go to cities and towns that may not have a gallery. Uh, however, there's quite a comprehensive education and, and community learning program that will accompany this uh, work. And the work really speaks about what a modern family is and about ecology and about nurture in the 21st century. And I look, I look forward to seeing it over the skies of Canberra and over the skies of cities and towns that don't have uh, galleries because the National Collection must connect with people and we must uh, ensure that Australians that don't have access to regional galleries or state galleries or are in proximity or can travel to the National Collection have the ability to have art in their lives. Um, the National Collection has to strive to um, be open and connect to as many people as we can. And so I'm excited that uh, the, this this work and the newly commissioned work will fly all around Australia and um, the barriers of, um, of gallery spaces won't get in the way of people experiencing art. And one of the things I love about art in the 21st century is that there are no rules, that artists can come up with different ways of making things and that um, in the 19th century, a painting or a, draw, a sand drawing or a woven basket or a bronze sculpture were, were art. But in the 21st century, it could be a hot air balloon. And I'm excited to think what art might be in 50 years' time. I think the important thing is that the National Collection continues to embrace the bronze sculptures from the 19th century the woven baskets, uh, the, the Impressionist paintings, but also the hot air balloons. And uh, finally, in terms of sh democratically sharing the National Collection, um, last week the National Gallery launched 1,500 billboards across Australia promoting the work of 45 women artists. So um, this is a shot uh, from Melbourne the work of 
one of the most extraordinary artists of the 20th century, Emily Kang Naware, um, from Utopia, uh, above a freeway. And um, this and uh, 1,499 other sites around Australia are the pop-up galleries of the 21st century of the National Collection. So I encourage you all to look out for the billboards uh, over the next six weeks. And uh, the billboards cover 82% um, of the population. So if you are walking past a billboard, um, you may well experience the work of an Australian women artist that you might fall in love with. And I encourage you to learn more about those women artists. And you'll hear more about um, the Know My Name project across Australia as we progress. I think that um, an artist like Emily Kang Naware is, um, is perfect for this. She's not a household name, but she should be. And in 2022, the National Gallery will stage the largest retrospective of, the, of what I consider to be one of the most innovative artists of the 20th century. And I think this exhibition will certainly uh, cause people to think uh, differently because it will show Emily Naware as a master of her craft and an artist that could stand up with any artist around the world. And one day I'm excited to present the work of Emily Naware next to another extraordinary figure of the 20th century, Jackson Pollock. Um, they have about 300,000 kilometres between them and about 50 years of art making. However, they were both passionate about the marks they made and they both leave quite a significant impact on the way that art changed after them. Ultimately, I want to see the National Collection connect with people and help us uh, come together as a community because, again, to mention, in times when we live in, um, in, uncertain, in an uncertain period where the unexpected has become every day, seeing the world through an artist helps us find a sense of peace, finds a sense of understanding. Uh, at times it might even ask us to ask more questions, but ultimately, Seeing the world through an artist um, enriches the experience of life. So I commend the National Collection to you and I'm happy to take your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Nick, for really inviting us to explore some big ideas there. So um, I really liked the way that you use landscape and geography to invite us to explore diverse views. Um, we do have time for some questions happily. We do have microphones on either side, um, but if someone would like the microphone brought to you, please just raise your hand. Um, Nick, I wonder if I may have the first question um, and if you've got any observations you could share with us about, is there something about political systems and democracy in particular that encourages a type of art? Well, I think um, over time, and history is such a great guide, you see um, uh, uh, play geographical centres that um, had an openness to ideas and an openness of ideas generally and this is a generalization is really defined by um, <laughs> democratic systems you're, you're seeing multiple points of view and um, i think that's such a dynamic part of art that um, uh, you see ideology playing out in different ways and i think you know for example um, in australia uh, you see how the environment and gender and uh, uh, the issues of uh, post-colonial Australia being played out in lots of different forms, uh, including music and theatre and poetry and art. And then you look at regimes that may not have an openness. And um, I, I certainly, you know, you don't see issues of environmentalism or gender playing out there because of the systematic controls. So I think. I hope that democracy does help nurture an inclusive approach to the voices that we have. You know, I think regardless of democracies, artists will always make art that's, that is at their heart. 
But that's not the issue. The issue is uh, what makes it into the public domain is really the issue. And uh, what we see um, at times when uh, political systems and structures change, you see art emerging that one was su is surprised about, but it was just um, uh, the un in the underside of things. It was kept under wraps. And uh, I think um, that's why art history is always changing. You th see things emerging that may have not had the ability to surface because of political structures. And um, that's really dynamic. And uh, I think that's one of the things that makes art and history uh, so um, alive. Thank you. Um, do we have a question? We do. Thank you. We've got a I'm couple of people. My glasses. <laughs> There's someone just down here looking for a microphone, and we'll take a question from this gentleman here. Thank you. Thank you for your talk. And I was interested in your juxtaposition of Indigenous and non-Indigenous art. Following up from your most recent comments, you talked about political expression, environmentalism, gender issues and so on. Uh, a lot of recent Indigenous art uh, focuses on social protest and expression of social views, past repre uh, repression, uh, uh, suicides and so on, contemporary aspirations. Uh, my question is whether uh, you have any ideas of showing that sort of art, much of it containing uh, words and expressions uh, and ideas, whether you have an aspiration of showing some of that kind of art together with non-Indigenous art also uh, taking a form of political protest or social protest. I think um, it's really important that um, uh, we, we, we take the pulse of art and show the best of everything. And um, uh, there was a number of works that I showed uh, there today that, that do that very uh, thing. Um, the, the, one of the first slides juxtaposed a John Gl a Glover uh, with the uh, work of, um, uh, oh, um, help me out here, um, Brisbane. We grew here. Thank you, Vernon Arkey. Uh, Vernon Arkey. Um, the National Collection has a lot of, of uh, well, has a has a series of works that reflect uh, the views and um, perspectives of um, certainly uh, political and urban artists like Fiona Foley or Vernon Arkey, Richard Bell, um, and. Uh, those, there's a number of those works already on display in the National Collection. Uh, I think that, uh, that uh, certainly since post-1970, um, there's, a, there's, a, there's been a, a, a great confidence in the work of Indigenous artists from urban centres that look at uh, the post-colonial era. And uh, I think that uh, those works have a potency and define a time. And it's important that the National Collection continues to collect those works and uh, continues to make sure that, uh, that, the, that there are multiple perspectives from that post-colonial era. Thank you. I think we have another question. Yes. Uh, look, thanks for um, a motivation to go and see both exhibitions as soon as possible. Uh, this will be a few days in the gallery coming up. But my question, particularly referencing the Senate, there's a current inquiry into, I think it's something, citizenship, national identity and democracy. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering whether you're going to take the committee to the gallery, give a repeat of this lecture, show them through the exhibition and get them to restore the funding for our national institutions, which is so important to our democracy and national identity. Um, <laughs> that's quite a politically charged question. <laughs> <laughs> My job is to make sure that um, uh, that uh, the national collection has the widest um, uh, has the widest ability to be seen uh, because it has potency. The parliament created the national collection to help all Australians define who we are, and uh, I hope belonging. Uh, will be seen very widely. I've already taken um, uh, a series of um, members of both houses through belonging and over the next uh, couple of months I'll continue to do that and uh, I have to say that 
we've had such a great response to it. Uh, and uh, I think that, uh, that when you use the, the language and the uh, perspectives of artists, there's a great sense of democracy about that in itself. Because we're not forming views, we're, liter we're, we're purely reflecting the views from lots of points of view. I think we do have uh, another question. Do we need a microphone? Are there any final questions? If not, I hope you will all join me in thanking Nick Mitsevich very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you um, in an, uh, to thank you for your presence today, um, I've um, brought tickets to Matisse and Picasso. And uh, so uh, between now and the 13th of April, if um, uh, you haven't seen that exhibition yet, um, there are tickets available at the door. Yes, at the door when you leave today. And um, the tickets, uh, as I said, are valid on any day between now and the 13th of April. So I hope you might see those two masters of the 20th century. And while you're there, also see uh, the project exhibition Belonging, uh, which hopes to tease out um, the big ideas of what it is to be Australian. So thank you very much.